So check it out, folks. If you're looking to cut through the noise of where to put your money, watch this video. My name is Rob Gill, President, Chairman, CEO of Epic Financial Strategies. And let's get into how to understand the financial landscape and what that looks like, not only with your short-term goals, but also with your long-term goals. And before I go any further, the most important thing to understand is that your right hand is speaking to your left hand. What does that mean? How do you have all your financial educators aligned that are tied into what your goals, objectives are, that your core values are, and who you are as a human being. I mean, listen, we all get handed down thoughts, mindsets, scarcity principles, as well as abundant principles. And if we already know that, hey, listen, money puts us in a state of, of, of chaos, money puts us, a state of, uh, puts us in a state of scarcity, we need to figure out a way on how to shift that thinking once we can figure out how to go from scarce to abundant, then we get the right professionals. We want to make sure that we invest in the real estate between our ears. And as a result of it, now all of our financial professionals are congruent because when you look at short-term investments, you have to look at the taxes a little bit differently than the long-term investments, right? So on the short term, it comes down to understanding, okay, what kind of risk do I really want to take? Is it worth it? Who's suggesting this? And does my accountant, does my fiduciary, and does my trust officer agree with this level, this level of risk? Same thing with the long-term. What does a long-term bucket look like? Well, it could be an IRA. It could be a 401k. It could also be an after-tax account. Both are taxed differently. And how does that align with what my goals and objectives are when I'm in my mid-30s versus mid-40s, either married, single, second, or third marriage, mid-50s, as I get to the retirement red zone? So if I want to play in that space and understand that if it is to be, it's up to me, right? It starts there, mindset first. But who's at your round table? Who's your top five? Whose shoulders are you going to stand on to be able to figure out what to do next? And it comes down to budgeting. What does your budgeting situation look like? In other words, when I say budget, I'm not talking about living in a place where you got you know envelopes and you have no money. I'm talking about what are you saving every month? Is it 10% of every check? Is it 15? Is it 20? Is that 10 or 15 or 20% after you contribute to your 401k or an IRA? Or is it included? If it's included, you may want to get to the point where eventually you get up to 20 after you put money into a 401k, including a match and or an IRA or other, other places that you like to deploy your capital. But in the end, it's totally up to understanding how are you going to make sure that whatever your game plan is, whatever you're budgeting for, you're not chasing a rate of return. You're not trying to keep up with the Joneses. As a matter of fact, it would be beneficial not even to know who the Joneses are. And if you could stay out of that mindset and really begin to create that wealth and opportunity, because wealth is a mindset, it's not about dead presidents on a piece of paper. It's a feeling. It's a feeling of abundance. It's a feeling of contribution and growth. So from that space and in that mindset, good things generationally can and will begin to happen to you. So now, how do we understand certain buckets that we can play with that give us the ability to get multiple uses of each and every dollar? Now, one of the things, and by the way, I'm not a fiduciary and I'm not here to tell you to put every single dollar into a cash value life insurance plan. Let me be very clear about that. The cash value life insurance plan is meant for the entrepreneur that understands they wanna get multiple uses of each and every dollar that does have a death benefit, but they wanna accelerate that money early so they can leverage it for other opportunities, right? You may have heard bank on yourself or become your own bank. And basically what that really means is you'll use a whole life. Some people use IULs, another conversation for another day, but the, the fact of the matter is, for the folks that want to buy real estate or other businesses, if in fact they overfund, and if in fact they want to leverage that while the arbitrage is in their favor, if you have any questions, feel free to add them below in the comments, the arbitrage is in the favor of the person that's leveraging it into another asset that is meant to, to either create cash flow or appreciate, and now you're getting multiple uses of each and every dollar. Let, let me make it real simple for you. Let's say you have a premium that's $10,000 a year, it's buying a certain death benefit and you want to dump it an extra 60 or 70,000, you could do that up to the MEC and, and the, the agent and or the carrier will be able to tell you what that is. The MEC, if you break through it, makes it taxable, so you don't want to do that. So now you dump in that 60,000, but then you want to borrow it back out to go buy a piece of rental real estate. Now remember, your premium is basically 10,000 a year, let's call it 800 a month, you dump in $50,000 or $60,000, you could probably get about, of that dumping, anywhere between 85 and 90% based on the policy, based on the rating, based on the gender. And when you borrow that money out, you want to make sure that the arbitrage is in your favor. In other words, you're paying interest on the money you borrow, but it's also earning uninterrupted interest inside the policy, including dividends. And now you put it into a piece of real estate. Now, 
If you're good in real estate, you're going to get four different rates of return off the same dollar. Cash flow, mortgage interest write off, depreciation. And by the way, if you sell something today, that means in the future you want to sell it at a higher price. But remember, the down payment you ran through the policy, so that's still going to get dividends and interest. Now it's in the real estate, getting four other rates of return. This is an ideal hypothetical situation. And now when the renter pays back the policy, you don't put it in your pocket, you pay back the money you borrow from yourself, that seventh rate of return is where they're talking about on becoming your own bank or bank on yourself. Instead of having that, that, that money earning a rate of return in the bank, like the rest of the mortgage payment will, at least this money you could recapture for yourself over time. That is what they're talking about whenever you hear people discuss that. Now, if you take that insurance plan and you, you, you complement it with the IRA and 401k, well, you're saying, Rob, how do I complement that with an IRA or 401k? Well, simple. When you get to retirement, you don't know what the tax bracket's going to be, and you know that at some point you're required to take distributions at age 73. But even before that, from 59 and a half on, you could start withdrawing from those qualified plans. But let's say, and I'm just making this up, hypothetically speaking, 10, 20, 30 years from now, we're in the highest tax bracket in history. Let's say, for whatever reason, it's 60, 70 percent. But you also have a bucket of cash inside your cash value policy, which, by the way, up to basis money you put in, when you withdraw that or borrow from that, there's no tax consequence. So you may want to take a certain amount out of the IRA or 401k, but much more out of the insurance. Now, vice versa, if taxes are even lower, significantly lower, you take less out of the insurance and more of the IRA and 401k. That's how you could potentially, and talk to your accountant, this is not a suggestion, but you could potentially manage the tax code. And these are some of the things that happen, and it ripples out into what is your qualified money, what is your after-tax money, what is your real estate, how does it complement with the insurance, with the death benefit. There's all of these little Swiss Army knife strategies that are available to you. You know, you now have your normal traditional diversification model. And the question is, how does life insurance help that? How does it buttress it? How does it create balance? How does it give you some safety features? Well, remember, if you qualify and you do get a policy, and if, in fact, you qualify even further for disability um, waiver of premium, that means if you become disabled, the, the insurance company is going to pay your premium up to a certain point in time based on the long-term disability. But also remember, if your money is inside the policy, which is growing, it gives you some, let's call it a seatbelt, some safety against some of the risky stuff that's inside the market. The biggest risk in the market, though, because let's say if you're a smart investor and you're long-term and you don't mess around and you really understand what's happening, and now you do the s and I'm just making this up, for 20 or 30 years, and we know there's a... There's a consistent historical rate of return, no guarantee, of course. The biggest risk in that scenario is when you get closer to retirement, do you stay in that model? Do you pull it out? If, the, if you're 63 and the market goes down 40 50% in that given year, sequence of returns rate risk, it could cause some harm, which means you would have to take another four, five, six years just to get back to where you were before the market pulled back. This is where the insurance becomes a complement because now... You know, you don't have to take on that level of risk knowing that this other, this other pile of money is over here, and it gives you those protective devices or protective strategies within there. And let me just reiterate this, because I don't want anyone to put me or this in a frame. Two things, I'm not a fiduciary, and I'm not telling you to put every dollar inside a cash value life insurance plan. I believe in the overall financial mosaic, if you have not only money in the market, if you have alternative investments, whatever that would be, businesses, real estate, finance your own debt, collectibles, gold, silver, and on top of that, the insurance, well, then it becomes really a, a place of, of safety. It becomes a mindset of abundance. It becomes somebody that is very comfortable in their skin, and they understand that if you want to grow, and as you're growing, you continue to contribute, then you get to grow more, continue to contribute, grow more. Don't ever get off that train once you get that momentum. And when momentum is in your world, don't ever lose sight of how beneficial arduous is. Arduous is, is that daily grind. Stay addicted to the arduous, because if you do, what will happen is momentum will never end. You could become very predictable in your approach, and then you get so good that you're not even going to be using your own money to strategize into these other investments. All right, so check this, folks. We want to be able to understand the power of the cash value and the dividend and the power of uninterrupted interest on leveraging out to other opportunities. I already mentioned real estate, but you could be someone that wants to buy businesses that... Um, some of these businesses have a good infrastructure, but they're not good in sales, and you're great in sales, and you're great at systems and processes, and sometimes you don't need money, but just in case you do, let's say if you leverage money out of your policy to go buy that business or to become a partner in that business where you're going to own a piece of it based on 
you know, the secret sauce that you bring that increases their profitability and whatever that increases, 10, 20, 30%, you get half of it. Remember, when you're leveraging the money, it's still growing inside the policy. And then as you become stronger and stronger in everything you do, what begins to happen is you now have a death benefit. This is important. Death benefit on term insurance expires. Death benefit on IULs to keep it later on in life becomes more and more expensive. So you want to make sure, this is important, please, you want to make sure that your death benefit never expires in whole life structured the right way because by the time you're past 5, 10, 20 years, the cost of insurance is out of it. Your death benefit doesn't expire, which means every asset you have outside that policy, you can now spend down in life, enjoy that wealth, live in that wealth, contribute and share that wealth. And then when you do shuffle off this mortal coil, the surviving spouse gets that death benefit check, uh, gets that death benefit tax free, and then they get to spend it down all over again because there's a policy on them. And then when they shuffle off, it goes to, to the kids and grandkids and everybody else. But even the surviving spouse gets to spend it down again and enjoy it with the family. That's a concept that you need all your professionals. Listen, don't just take what I said and call some insurance agent and buy life insurance. It's important that you sit down with your accountant, trust officer, insurance agent, fiduciary. Make sure that there's a full game plan. Now, a lot of fiduciaries, you know, they, they live in a certain frame. Some like it, some don't. A lot of accountants like tax write-offs versus tax strategies. So you got to make sure you understand who you're talking to. No one is wrong, just so we're clear. And no one is 100% right. However, what I can tell you, Ray Dalio said it best, there's about 18 different asset classes. And at any given point in the history of any given asset class in any given year, it'll drop anywhere between 50 and 75%. So if you diversify within and amongst asset classes with a strategy, you know, knowing the insurance could be the baseline of that strategy, which provides all kinds of safety and seatbelts that put you in a place to prosper, first of all, mentally, and then secondly, you're able to utilize that money for other opportunities, especially when economic winter comes your way. Well, that's the holy grail, and that's the strategies that put you in a place to, to, to be able to sleep at night, provide for your family, and be able to share lifestyle with your family, because you can have a lot more fun in a beach house than you can in an IRA. Not that one's better than the other, but both have a lot of value. Anyway, the last thing I want to get into is the importance of partnering and or interviewing financial professionals. And I think you should interview four or five fiduciaries, accountants, trust officers, insurance agents, estate attorneys, all that. I think if you spend that time, you may say, Rob, I can't do five. I'll do one or two. Great. But at least if you spend that time... Remember, their job on the fiduciary side is to really get to know who you are, what your goals and objectives are, you know, your whole mindset around money, your philosophy, the level of risk that you want to do. So, so those are real important conversations. And I think that once you graduate through that process of interviewing all these people, you then want to see if they have the ability to work together for your benefit. Because you don't want the accountant giving you one opinion and the fiduciary giving you another opinion, but they're not together in the same meeting. So you you don't want to play middleman between both of them and say, well, he said this or she said that. That's why the Epic Wealth Builder is so important. That's our online, you know, really a personal financial website through eMoney. We call it the Epic Wealth Builder. And it puts all your data on one landing page, real time at the click of a button. So any kind of decisions you make are based on logic, math, and science, not emotional timidity. And you could stress test certain things that you want to be able to do. If you have all your planners that are on that Wealth Builder that tie back to what your goals and objectives are, and now all of a sudden, as you're making moves because you're growing, everybody being aligned because you're meeting them on a quarterly basis, semi-annual basis, that means that you're keeping up with things that are happening externally. And at the same time, you're tied to an economic philosophy that you put together. Here's the key, and this is important. When you have an economic philosophy and you have a team, you have a bunch of teammates on your side that are, that job is not just to say yes, to challenge each other, to come up with a solution for you, when economic winter comes and everybody around you has no money, you'll be liquid and you'll be able to buy things on discount. Anyway, thank you for checking us out. Continue to follow. If you have any questions, if you wanna, if you wanna add any comments or if there's any videos you would want me to do, feel free to do it. But in the meantime, we're gonna offer you a free consultation. By the way, there's no obligation for you to do anything at all. If you go ahead, just fill out the information below. One of the people here at Epic will sit down and spend time with you, answer any questions you may have. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button because every day we're dropping content on a daily basis.